One day, a man was, told, was asked to recite a story from the Bible. So he chose to tell them the story of the Good Samaritan, a favorite story of his. And here's what he said. There once was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked him. He then got into a chariot and drove furiously. When he was driving under a big juniper tree, his hair got caught in the limb of that tree, and he hung there many days. The ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink, and he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. One night, while he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came and cut off his hair, and he dropped and fell on the stony ground. And he got up and continued on. Soon it began to rain, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The water rose so high that a great fish swallowed him, but threw him up three days later. Being confused by all these events, he hid himself in a cave and lived on locusts and wild honey. When he finally got to Jericho, he looked up and saw that old queen Jezebel sitting up high on a window, and she laughed at him. The man became furious and said, throw her down out there. And so they threw her down. And then he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times 7. And and of the pieces that remained, they picked up 12 baskets full besides women and children. Then the man said, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. Now whose wife will she be on judgment day, he concluded. My former seminary professor used to say, technically, if you step on an ant, all the information is still there. It's just disorganized. And I suppose if you disorganize something enough, you can kill it. I think that's the point of the story. In the same way, that story I just read to you guys has all the right facts, but it's the wrong story. And disorganization has a way of killing a narrative. The same is true of our scripture today. The, the chronology that the disciples were expecting to take place of, John, of, of Elijah and the Messiah and the coming of things and the timing that they were expecting wasn't playing out the way they were expecting it to. And someone needed to help put it together for them, as we find in today's scripture. Jesus had just taken Peter, James, and John up on the mountaintop for an incredible experience up on the mountain of transfiguration. And they watched as Jesus transfigured into his pre-incarnate glory and was joined by Moses and Elijah. And by the way, I know, just as a quick aside, I didn't have time to squeeze in last week. Many of you guys know Moses wasn't able to make it into the promised land. He was disqualified. But where was he in that paragraph, in that last passage we did? Holy moly, he made it after all. (laughs) He made it into the promised land. He eventually reached the, the other side of the Jordan, quite literally and figuratively. Praise God. God is merciful. But after all of that, after this incredible mountaintop experience, we pick up the narrative in verse 9 that says, And when they were coming down the mountain... Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. A reminder that (laughs) perhaps every mountaintop experience must come to an end eventually. You know, there's something to be said of these mountaintop experiences that we speak of as, really, especially as part of our Christian lingua, we talk about these mountaintop experiences of like of uh, just getting away with God and having these high experiences of worship and joy, whether it be at a church service, uh, some of the retreats that we have historically done over the years or conferences that we may have gone to. It's a mountaintop experience. You just see everything from a different perspective. You meet God in a powerful way. And I, I, I think that that colloquialism comes back to what we just read about earlier in this chapter, how Peter, James, and John got away from the hustle and bustle of ministry to just go on top of the mountain and just be with Jesus and experience him in a powerful way. And really, that's really what I see there as he revealed himself in his transfiguration to them on the mountain. However, Much like we in our mountaintop experiences, he couldn't 
Peter's request was denied. They couldn't just build tents and stay up there on the mountaintop. They had to come down to the valley again. There was still work to be done. And I certainly resonate with that this week. Just earlier this week, some of you guys know I was away on a pastor's conference. And it was such, oh, it ministered to my soul. Get Just getting a chance to be away with some 1,600 other pastors, all gathered together, worshiping God. There is nothing else like that. Nothing beats the thunderous bass of over a 1,000 men singing at the top of their lungs. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. That's, I'm still halfway up the mountain, as you can tell. But there have been interesting movements throughout church history that have attempted to capture these mountaintop moments and just stay there. Like, I don't want to leave this moment. I don't want to leave. I don't want to go back to the way things were. I just want to stay here on this retreat. I just want to stay at this conference. I just don't want this church service to end, this revival service to end, whatever it might be. But God calls us back to our streets. He calls us down from those experiences because otherwise we would never leave them. He sends us back because there's still work to be done here at home, out there on Broadway. God's not done with our areas yet. But moving on, Jesus commanded them on the way down to tell no one about what they had experienced until he was raised from the dead. Interesting. But it makes sense. You know, they didn't understand what happened themselves yet. Much less, how are they going to tell other people about this now? That's only going to go disastrously. So he told them to wait until after the resurrection when they themselves could make more sense of their experience. So they're not, no one misreads what happened and try to make Jesus a political messiah. However, they had an important question for Jesus in verse 10 where it said, and the disciples asked them, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? The chronology they expected wasn't happening. Based off of our first reading from Malachi 4 this morning, they were expecting Elijah to return to the earth first before the coming of the Messiah. Who, by the way, Elijah himself, many of you guys know uh, from from Old Testament, he did not, he actually was one of the few Old Testament saints that actually never died. He was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot in 2 Kings 2. And based off of that and the reading that we saw already, there was this expectation that he would return and restore Israel to true worship before the, uh, as had been part of his ministry in First. Kings, uh, leading them away from idolatry, and then the Messiah would return and come into his temple as Malachi 3 describes. And then the day of the Lord would come, which is described all throughout scripture in many terms, the day of judgment, uh, the tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble, all of it referring to this time of coming, this time at the end of the ages. But they had a problem. They have the Messiah. Jesus is standing right there, but they don't have Elijah. And they're saying, okay, well, what gives? How do you have a king without the forerunner of the king? In what sense will the forerunner come after the king has already arrived? That that doesn't make sense. And frankly, to this day, you know, the Jews are still confused about this very topic. To this day, if you attend a Jewish Passover Seder, they will leave an empty seat at the table just in case Elijah wants to join them. You know, because they're still expecting Elijah being the next thing on the calendar. So they're they're wondering, okay, well, what gives? And because Matthew, who's writing this gospel that we're reading from, his primary audience was to the first century Jews, He anticipated this question, and he made sure to include this narrative and Jesus' response here in verse 11, where he said, and he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. 
Note the language here. It's important. He says that Elijah does come and Elijah has already come. One of the most difficult things to wrap your minds around when you're learning how to interpret biblical prophecy is that there's two sides of it, the near-term fulfillment and the far-term fulfillment. And it can get rather confusing. Um, to, to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about, it's like what happens if you've ever driven out into you know, northwest Jersey or out into Pennsylvania. You drive out into the Appalachian Mountains. And as you do so, it can, sometimes as you're looking at a mountain, it can be hard to differentiate when one ends and another begins. Am I looking at a mountain with two peaks, or is there a larger mountain behind this one? Is it right behind it, or is it miles behind it? And I just can't tell from my perspective. And it's only with a greater perspective that you're able to see what's going on. You know, to really understand what you're looking at. And biblical prophecy is exactly like that. There's a, sometimes even one verse can refer to Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Seemingly, uh, with no transition between the two. I, Isaiah, just to give an easy to understand example, Isaiah 61 is one of the best. Because it's a scripture you guys have all heard before and there's a part of it you guys aren't going to recognize, necessarily. Uh, speaking of Jesus, Isaiah writes and says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God. Hold on, one, of the, one part of that doesn't sound familiar to me, John. One of those doesn't seem to fit the rest of those parts. Well, that line that you, that, there, and there's a reason for that. G, we know that scripture so well because when Jesus was handed the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue and he preached from this passage, he opened it up, read up until just before that last phrase very purposely stopped there at that comma and said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That part was referring to his first coming, but that part of the day of vengeance of our God, that little comma separates Jesus' first and second coming right there. So even though it's just a comma separating those words, they are thousands of years apart. And the whole Old Testament, all of the the prophetic books are very much like that. So with that in mind, I'm not just getting technical for the sake of being technical. It comes in handy because with that in mind, the Jews failed to see that Elijah's coming was also coming in two sections. That in both that his first and second coming, if you will, were coming corresponding to Jesus's two comings. Elijah will come perhaps literally, before the, just before the great and awesome day of the Lord um, in the future tense. Personally, I believe he's one of the two witnesses written about in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, but I'll have to get off of that horse because I'll never get off of that one if I go there. I'll have to address that another time. However, Jesus also said that Elijah has already come. And he did in one sense, just, just here in this paragraph in the, in the mountaintop experience. He appeared right there on the mountain with Jesus. That's one sense. But much more was it fulfilled in the form of John the Baptist, as it says here, who fulfilled the role of Elijah at Jesus' first coming. How do we make sense of that? Well, just as the Messiah was sometimes called David in the Old Testament, uh, uh, John the Baptist here is called Elijah as somewhat of a title. Jeremiah 30 verse 9 talks about how people will serve God and David their king. But there's just one interesting fact. David's already dead by the time Jeremiah was writing. So Jeremiah wasn't talking about David who they will serve. They were talking about the son of David, the Messiah. He was the one that that passage was talking about. And in the same sense, Elijah's role would be fulfilled by another, John the Baptist. 
who was told even when he was born, in, uh, or just before he was born, being announced by an angel in uh, Luke 1. It was said that John the Baptist would turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to the children and to the disobedient of, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared, which is exactly what John the Baptist did in his ministry, calling people to repentance and restoring true worship to Israel. In Elijah's time in 1 Kings, he was calling people away from the idolatry that had so proliferated Israel at that time, calling the people to turn away from all the false idols that they were worshiping and turn back to the one true God. And that's very much what John the Baptist did at his coming too, except he wasn't calling people away from open and obvious idolatry, obviously worshiping false gods but he was calling them away from self-righteous legalism. That's what he was calling people away from. Such self-sufficient self-worship is just as antithetical to the gospel as worshiping other gods. Because either way, you're either trusting in another god or trusting in yourself. Both roads lead to hell. It's only by trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save you from your sins that there is salvation. He alone saves, not yourself or other pretend gods, if you will. And that is how John the Baptist fulfilled his role as the spirit and power of Elijah, calling people away from these other roads that also do not lead to life and salvation. And in that sense, he fulfills all of the roles that pertained to Elijah. He was, as Isaiah 40 said, uh, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Or Malachi 3, 1 that said, behold, I send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. It's exactly what John the Baptist did, prepared the way of Christ. So that when he finally was revealed, the people who were seeking him were ready. But the final obvious objection comes from John chapter 1. How can John be Elijah if he was asked directly, are you Elijah by the Pharisees and the scribes? And he said, no, I am not. How can this be? This seems like a contradiction. Well, except the question itself is wrong. John the Baptist was no more Elijah than Jesus was literally David. He wasn't literally Elijah. He would have been lying if he said, yes, I am Elijah. That's my name. Here's it on my birth certificate. He couldn't say that. He wasn't actually Elijah, although he came to fulfill his ministry. So Elijah was very careful to separate who he is and what his ministry was. That's what's going on here. And that's how it comes together. John the Baptist came not in name, but in the spirit and power and title of Elijah to fulfill his ministry that that corresponded with Jesus' first coming. And and just before Jesus' second coming, uh, perhaps literally, he he will come again in some form before the great day of the Lord. I hope that makes sense. I know it's complicated to sort through all of that, but it's a complicated question. Every answer related to the Bible or every question has an answer. I can't always say I can answer it in a 30-second soundbite, though. But it's there. Jesus also noted what happened to John the Baptist in our text this morning, saying that they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Jesus is reminding them of what they did to John the Baptist. Just a few chapters before in the Gospel of John, in cha- oh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, some of you remember he was beheaded for, for teaching the truth. And if that's how they treated the forerunner of the Messiah, how are they going to treat the king? How are they going to treat the one who is actually coming to to accomplish all these things? 
Jesus is very clearly reminding them, as is the theme of this whole section, that the march towards the cross has begun. Whether you like it or not, Peter, it's going to happen. This is the plan. It's been the the plan since the foundation of the world that Jesus would come and go to the cross, as is highlighted all throughout the pages of Scripture. So as we work towards a conclusion this morning, how would you receive a preacher like John the Baptist or Elijah? How would you receive a preacher like that into your church? Would you call them your pastor or your preacher if they were invited to come here, come in on a given Sunday to fill in for me? And before you answer the obvious right answer, think about that. Really think about what it would mean. Because these men told people what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. They spoke very, very boldly. And they didn't speak on very flowery issues or speak to people's felt needs. He taught them the truth of the gospel, which includes the bad news that we are sinners in need of repentance. You know, I think about the most popular preachers of our time today, and you show me any top ten list, seven or eight of them are going to be people that just are out there to make people feel good about themselves, make people feel confident and feel affirmed when they leave church. That's not how John the Baptist preached. That's not how Elijah preached. John the Baptist called for repentance, for fasting, for mourning over your sins, for realizing the depth of which we have sinned against a holy and perfect God and what a problem that is. And that's not such an issue that we can just brush off. And he taught that way so that we would understand after seeing how bad the bad news is, that we would see the glorious good news of Christ for how wonderful it is. To understand this is how condemned I was, but this is how forgiven I am now? Wow. That was the point. And no doubt, I am convinced that that message would get him thrown out of many churches if John the Baptist was a preacher today. As many churches, (laughs) frankly, they're affirming people in their sins, celebrating people's sins, rather than calling them out and calling them to repentance as they are biblically called to do. Many preachers, where these preachers are trying to make them feel good, when sometimes you need to feel bad leaving church. And yes, I'm saying that as the preacher. (laughs) Let me tell you, some of the most meaningful and impactful sermons that I can still remember years after the fact today are the ones that didn't make me feel good afterwards, but made me feel the sting of conviction of sin. Because that's what I needed to hear. That's what I needed to experience. Because godly sorrow leads to repentance. It leads to life. And we need that from time to time. We need to be refined by the word of God, letting it have that work in our life. So the question remains on the table. Do we hear and receive the call in the spirit of Elijah today? Do we hear his call to flee the trap of legalism, thinking that our works, how we present outwardly to others, automatically makes us righteous? Do we hear the call to flee formalism, thinking our emphasis on tradition, on ritual and liturgy makes our worship any more acceptable than the tax collector who just simply bowed his head before God and beat his breast, saying, oh God, have mercy upon me. A sinner. Do we hear his call to flee from denominationalism, thinking that our label as Presbyterians means anything? Or from what has been called easy believism, which is what we've been addressing in Matthew 17 and 16. This this question of, you know, can we follow Jesus without taking up our cross and following him? which, as we've seen, is an option we have not been given. The voice that was crying out in the wilderness still calls out for us today. 
Is your own heart right with God? Are your actions congruent with a heart that is right with God? And have you prepared the way for the Lord in your own heart? I certainly hope you have. Thanks be to God.